Hi there, and welcome to Heron Bridge Community Church's first ever video sermon. This is our first Sunday that we are unable to meet as a congregation together in one place. Um, now, I know many of you are meeting in small groups already. You're meeting in homes. Maybe due to short notice, you have not yet found a group. If that is the case, why don't you please go onto the church's website and fill in the online form there so that we can get you connected. And if you're having difficulties for whatever reason, please won't you get in touch with Trish or myself by phoning or sending us an email. If you are not receiving emails or SMSs from the church, then it means that you're not on the database. So if you're watching this video and you haven't received an SMS or an email, won't you please get in touch with us so that we can get your details so that you, we can communicate with you and keep you up to date on what is happening. And then also just generally, um, we need to ensure that our church community, the wider church community, is up to date and knows what is going on. So won't you please ensure that your church friends um, know what's happening and that church services will still be taking place every week like this. Uh, we need to look out for each other at this time. And um, the Bush Telegraph system needs to kick in to make sure that everybody is up to speed and on board with where we are going right now. Now, opinion is divided as to whether we should even be meeting in small groups. The view of the church leadership as of this past Tuesday is that we would love to see as many people as possible meeting in small groups so that we can continue to be church as normally as possible until such time that we can again meet uh, safely face to face as a large group. But you know, things may change. The situation really is fluid. If we go into a complete lockdown, which isn't impossible, then we cannot meet with others. And then virtual groups on a platform like Zoom become an option. I know the young adults are already meeting this way. So if you'd like to find out more, we can put you in touch with them and they can organize some virtual training for you. If you are meeting together in a home, please be very, very conscious and be very careful uh, to exercise healthy uh, sanitary practices and, and hygiene. Wash your hands when you arrive. Wash your hands when you leave. Avoid all physical contact. Try to keep a little bit of a distance between you as you sit down. Don't squish a whole bunch of you into a room that's too small. Uh, if you need to cough or sneeze, not because you're sick, but because you've got an itch, then cough or sneeze into, into the crook of your elbow. And definitely don't go to the group if you are feeling unwell, if you have a sore throat, fever, you know, that sort of thing. If you are elderly or have any underlying health conditions that will make you more susceptible to infection, then please do stay away and, and do exercise extra caution in self-isolating yourself. And folks, really, the, the safest approach probably is for all of us to assume that we are infected. So just be conscious of what you're touching and of what and who you are potentially infecting. Bearing in mind that as far as we know, the virus is only spread through droplets of saliva. So keep your saliva to yourself. I must just say, despite the unusual circumstances that we find ourselves in at present, it is very biblical for the church to be meeting in homes and in groups. This is exactly how the early church did it. Okay, they didn't have TVs and computers and cameras and things, but you get the idea. So today we find ourselves in a very unique situation, to say the least. The world has never, ever experienced anything like this before. Yes, there have been pandemics in the past, but we have never before been connected as we are now. And I don't think we've ever had the kind of governmental responses around the world that we are experiencing right now. And the situation is fluid. It is changing all the time. And the question that I want to encourage us all to grapple with at this time is how do we as believers, how do we respond to what is going on in the world right now? Now, I've heard responses from, from both ends of a, of a very wide spectrum. Some Christians saying, you know, we're protected by the blood of Jesus. Psalm 91, he wants no pestilence or disease to touch us. And so we carry on as normal and we ignore the instructions and the, and the, the orders and the suggestions to not, you know, to not mingle and not to go out there. The other extreme is stockpile. 
Buy everything you can. Lock yourself in your house. These are the end times. The, the apocalypse has arrived and we're all going to die. Now, I think the, the sane, healthy Christian response is, is something in the middle. It's a combination. Yes, let's be careful. Let's not be reckless and cavalier because that could unnecessarily endanger others, if not ourselves. But as believers, we also do have a higher calling and a different perspective to the world and the problems that the world faces, or we should have anyway. The scriptures encourage us. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. John chapter 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give, with, I give you, Jesus says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so, friends, the Bible tells us, exhorts us to not be scared, anxious, or fearful. But we are also called to look out for one another and to be salt and light in the communities where God has placed us. And a situation like this presents us with amazing opportunities to really display a Christ-like attitude and response. There is going to come a time in our church when people in our church family are going to need help. They may need groceries taken to them or meals prepared for them. They may need to be nursed through sickness. If this virus takes root in, in the poorer communities, it is going to be devastating. And our brothers and sisters in those communities are going to need more than just our prayers. They're going to need our help. And that means that we may need to expose ourselves to risk. And we need to be willing to count the cost. In Thailand, the gospel initially took root through ministry to lepers. Christians went in, they ministered, they loved, they cared for those whom nobody else would go near. Some missionaries even got leprosy. But the love of God was visibly displayed through them and the church grew. COVID-19 may just be the new leprosy that gives us believers the opportunity to minister to a fearful and hopeless world around us. Just some practical suggestions. If you live in a street or a neighborhood that is a WhatsApp group, why not consider offering to do the grocery shopping for the elderly or the frail or the sick people in your street or in your neighborhood? Find ways to reach out and help others in their time of need and distress. Here is an example of a card that you can put in someone's post box. It says, hello, if you are self-isolating, I can help. My name is, my phone number is, I live at. And there are some boxes that they can tick. If you are self-isolating, I can help with getting your shopping, a friendly first phone call, urgent supplies, prayer. Um, and it says, I'll do my best to help you and I won't infect you. I'll, I'll keep two mis uh, meters away. I'll wash my hands. So you, you, know, you just tell them that everything's going to be good. But that's an example of how you can get involved and help somebody in a very real, very practical way. I've mentioned before that it has been shown in times of disaster that those who look out for others are more likely to survive. When we look beyond our own needs to the needs of others, it wakens a certain resilience within us. In addition to that, though, it is also an incredible witness of the love of Christ. If you have a domestic worker who has to travel in a crowded taxi to get to your house every day or three times a week, please won't you consider giving her time off on full pay if necessary so that she can stay home reduce her risk of infection, and take care of her own family. It's going to make your life slightly more hard, um, but cleaning your own home and ironing your own clothes um, really is a small price to pay in the scheme of things. I personally hate ironing, so here's advance notice. Uh, I'll be wearing creased clothing until further notice, unless I can convince my children to do my ironing for me. Furthermore, friends, as this thing gets really bad, Many people are going to be asking questions. People are going to be questioning life. They're going to be questioning their worldview. 
Many people are going to be struggling financially. Businesses are going to close. People are going to come face to face with their own mortality. They're looking for answers. Now is the time when you are able to share with people the reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. A great quote that I found on the Gospel Coalition website this week says, Now is the time for the church to rise, to move forward, to, sorry, to move toward others in faith when everyone else is pulling away. So I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to be open to God's leading and prompting in this time, to be used by Him in mighty ways, ways that you have up until now not even contemplated. And may you truly experience the peace and the joy of Christ as you do that. From next Sunday, we hope to have live worship. Lene and the worship team will bring you worship from my sitting room here in Blegari, and we really are going forward into a new normal. And so just a word of thanks to Steve for helping to make all of this possible, setting everything up. Uh, he's done an incredible job in just a few days to make this possible. Next Sunday is also the last Sunday of the month, and so as is our regular practice, we will have communion together virtually. So please be prepared for that next week. Make sure that you have some bread uh, on hand. And if you're meeting in a group, I would suggest that you cut the bread up into small pieces beforehand so that you don't have people handling it as they break the bread. And have some red grape juice available. Please don't share utensils. Have separate glasses or, or cups uh, for everybody. Folks, we also realize that at this time, there may be, there are additional stresses and pressures on all of us as a result of this pandemic. If you want to connect or you want someone to pray with you face to face, please let me know. I would be very, very happy to come to you or to Zoom or to Skype with you. And I'm sure our elders also would be happy to do that. Okay, before we turn now to, to God's word, let us just pray together. Lord, we just thank you that we're able to meet like this virtually. Lord, thank you for the ability and the facilities to do this. And Lord, just thank you that right now around the world, millions of people are connecting this way. And Lord, even though it is so different to what we're used to, we just trust that you are going to continue to do a great and mighty work through your church. Lord, that we won't be held back, that we won't be hampered through this but that your word would continue to go out and that your word would not return void. Father, help us to be wise during this time. Help us not to be fearful, but help us to be careful. And Lord, help us to, to be bold and to be courageous if and when we need to. And so, Father, as we turn to your word now, we just pray your presence with us. We pray your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we continue with our Ephesians series called In Christ for Christ. And today, our reading comes from Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 1 to verse 13. So if you want to grab your Bible or your device, uh, reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms 
according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So quite a, quite a long reading, um, but we're just going to pick a few salient points out of that passage this morning as we look at it. So please keep your Bibles open so that you can follow, as I will be jumping around a bit in this passage as I unpack it. What we have here in this passage is the beginning of a prayer that Paul is praying for the Ephesians. And he starts in verse 1 with that prayer. But then as soon as he mentions the word Gentiles there in verse 1, he gets sidetracked. Uh, He digresses. And Paul starts to speak about his own apostolic ministry to the Gentiles and the significance of his ministry. We'll see next week when we uh, pick up in verse 14 that Paul picks up where he left off in verse 1 and he continues with his prayer. So this passage we're looking at today is a digression. It's an aside as Paul speaks of his ministry and the significance of his ministry. And he starts off by saying that he is a prisoner. Now, we don't know where exactly Paul was in prison at this time. It could have been in Caesarea, in Palestine, or it could have been in Rome. But it's not really important. What is important is that Paul calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. This is significant and important because it shows us that Paul sees his present situation in prison as on behalf of Christ and as part of his service to Christ. Now, with that kind of perspective and with that mindset, one can put up with a lot without complaining and or feeling sorry for yourself. Paul had every reason to be angry and to be disappointed and to feel that he had failed and to blame God as he sat in a prison for doing God's work. But instead, we see a man who is positive, he's upbeat, and he's willing to continue the work that God has called him to, even though he is imprisoned. Folks, maybe it is appropriate for us right now, as we are to some extent prisoners in our own homes, to consider ourselves prisoners of Christ Jesus, willing to be used by him for his glory. And that just goes back to what I said earlier. How can we shine? How can we make a difference for Christ at this time? What is our response as believers to the circumstances that we find ourselves in right now? Paul also says there in verse 1 that he is a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. You see, the only reason that Paul was in prison was because he believed He preached and he taught that Gentiles had the same access to God that the Jews had. If he had not been so outspoken about the equality of Jew and Gentile, and if he had not been so committed to bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, he would not have been in jail. And we see here a very, very clear example of Paul's theology of suffering. If we, if we jump to, to verse 13 at the end there, the last verse of this passage, Paul says, Do not be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So we see that Paul clearly views his hardship positively. For him, the privilege of working for God far outweighs the difficulties involved in that. How willing are we to face hardship? and to be put out for the sake of the gospel. Fortunately for us in this country, uh, we should never have to endure prison for the sake of the gospel. But what are we willing to endure? According to a 2014 article in Christianity Today, 70 million Christians have been martyred for their faith since Jesus walked the earth. That article was six years ago, so that number is probably significantly higher by now. 70 million people, that's more than the entire population of South Africa. 70 million people who have been martyred for their faith. Sadly, much of modern Christianity seems to have an unhealthy focus 
on being blessed and protected and looked after and cared for by God. Friends, we rather need to have a healthy theology of suffering and hardship because that may just be what God is calling us to. The Apostle James said, Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Folks, when we face hardship, when we have to put up with difficulty, when there are trials, we identify with the cross. It's not easy, but nor is it optional. And it is always costly. We cannot show self-giving love and serve ourselves at the same time. Like Paul, the way that we define ourselves must come from Christ and not from our circumstances. As Paul unpacks God's marvelous plan for the Gentiles, he uses the word mystery four times. We see it in verse 3, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 9. This mystery is very, very important for Paul, and it comes up again and again in his writings. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love a good mystery. Whether it's a novel or a movie, you know, something that keeps you, you know, guessing and on the edge of your seat uh, right until that last chapter keeps the pages turning or, or the last scene in the movie. Mysteries are absolutely great. But this is not the kind of mystery that Paul is talking about here. It's not a whodunit kind of mystery that he's referring to. In the ancient world, a, a mystery was something that was hidden from all, except those who had special insight. It was used in the religious sense to refer to something unknown, so, sorry, something known only to those initiated into a particular belief system. In the context that Paul is using the word here, it refers to something beyond natural knowledge, something once hidden that has now been revealed by God. In verse 3 here, Paul says that this mystery has been made known to him by revelation. In other words, the mystery has been divinely revealed to him through and by the Holy Spirit. It is known only because God has revealed it to him. In the context here, the mystery refers to the revelation given to Paul that the Gentiles are included in Christ as equals. In Paul's other writings, such as Colossians 1 verse 26, the mystery is the word of God. In Colossians 2 verse 2, the mystery is Christ himself. In any event, it is something that was previously hidden that has now been revealed to Paul supernaturally. In verse 5, Paul goes on to emphasize that this mystery was hidden until the appearance of the apostles. So throughout the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, whilst the Gentiles were included in God's purposes, there had been no revelation at that point that indicated at all that the Gentiles would be accepted by God on equal footing with the Jews. In the Old Testament context, they only knew that all the nations would be blessed through Israel. And so essentially, the only hope for the Gentiles was that they would become proselytes to Judaism. And even then, they were restricted from full participation uh, in the fullness of what God had to offer Israel. So for thousands and thousands of years, this mystery remained hidden from mankind. But it was always God's plan. And when the time was right, God revealed this mystery to the man of the moment, to Paul. And friends, the primary emphasis of this mystery, uh, the revelation that Paul received, is the oneness, the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's plan. Now, as you may recall, Paul has already emphasized this in the last 12 verses of chapter 2. And we looked at that over the last few weeks. There, Paul tells us that the barrier between Jew and Gentile, the dividing wall of hostility has been destroyed. And here he is stressing this again. And Paul emphasizes this. He stresses this in verse 6 by using alliteration in the original Greek text. He says, heirs together. 
members together of one body and sharers together. God's promises were formerly made to Israel, but now Gentiles are heirs together with the Jewish Christians. And as heirs, they receive a full share of all the benefits flowing from them being heirs. Jew and Gentile are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now, for us today, sitting here in 2020, this may not seem like such a big deal. I mean, it's, it's really nice that God has given us access to himself and that we can share all the benefits formerly offered to Israel and God's chosen people. But at that time, in Paul's time, this revelation was absolutely mind-blowing and it rocked the Jewish world. And that's precisely why Paul was imprisoned. He came out with the most ridiculous sounding thing and he ended up in jail for it. But this mystery that was revealed to Paul, this revelation that he received changed the world completely because it birthed the church. The appearance of the church on the horizon of history is next to the birth, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most significant spiritual event ever. Let's take a look at that. In verse 10, Paul gives us the crux of the matter. The reason why God called the church into being and why he created one new humanity out of Jew and Gentile. Here in verse 10, we are shown the lofty cosmic role of the church. The church is God's chosen instrument by which his wisdom is demonstrated to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. The church was God's master plan from eternity past. Before God even started creating, he had the church in mind. Verse 11 says that it was God's eternal purpose, his eternal purpose, that through Jesus Christ, the church would reveal and demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And so we see that Jesus has established the church not as a replacement for Israel, but as a fulfillment of what God intended all along, to be one people of God from all nations. The church isn't an afterthought. It isn't God's B plan that he had to implement after his A plan, Israel, failed. Friends, and so we see the incredibly important and vital role that the church is to play in furthering God's kingdom on earth. We are called and we are equipped and we are empowered to be God's representatives, his ambassadors on earth, because we are the church, which he purposed from before creation to be that. And that brings us back to, to verses 7 and 8. And I'm jumping around a bit in here, but stay with me. Uh, verse 7 and 8 shows us that God's grace is not just for our salvation. In chapter 2, verse 8, Paul tells us, or Paul told us, that we are saved by grace through faith. And we looked at this passage a few weeks ago, and we saw that this is the foundation of our belief. We are saved by grace through faith. But here in verse 7, Paul adds something, something extra to that. He says that he became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. And in verse 8 and 9, he says, This grace was given to him to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of God's grace and to make plain the administration of this mystery. So friends, what we see is that grace not only saves us, and connects us to God and Christ and to each other. But grace also enlists us and empowers us for the good works that God prepared for us in advance to do in Christ. Paul was chosen and we are chosen as God's servants, not based on our ability, but on God's grace. Grace is the gift of ministry. It always brings responsibility. Grace connects, it enlists, and it empowers. 
Grace will not allow us to be passive because it is God's work in us. To bring that back to our situation today, we are facing a crisis around the world and we are in a unique position to impact people's lives, not because of the coronavirus, not because of our willingness to be instruments in God's hands, but because of His grace. The ability and the opportunity to speak hope and life into the world is a gift of God's grace given to each and every one of us. And so, taken to its natural conclusion, to its logical conclusion, when we do not boldly step out and serve others, when we do not boldly share the good news of Jesus Christ where and when we can, and if we do not live holy lives of obedience to God, we are in effect shunning God's grace. We are saying no to His grace. To summarize then, God's mystery that was revealed to Paul is that Jew and Gentile are one. And together they make up, they compose this new creation, a new humanity called the church. And it is by God's grace, effected through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that disparate individuals receive forgiveness of sins and are saved and called into the body, into the household, into the temple of God, the church. The church is a collection of people from every nation, united as one in fulfilling God's purpose of establishing his kingdom here on earth. And the same grace that saves us, enlists us and empowers us and motivates us to action. The task of ministry is not limited to the professional clergy, to the elders, to the person who has been a Christian for X number of years. No, the task of ministry is common to all of us because grace calls all of us, even though some of us may have unique responsibilities. And furthermore, the work of ministry is not our gift to God. But we sometimes fall into that erroneous way of thinking. Paul clearly sees ministry as God's gift to him. If we can get this perspective right, it will radically change the way we see our ministry. Ministry is the free flow of, of God's grace from God through us to other people. It is an incredible privilege and it comes packaged with, it is part and parcel of being part of this incredible body, the church. Just because we cannot meet and serve one another face to face for the time being doesn't mean that our call to ministry has been suspended. On the contrary, I believe our unique circumstances now provide even more opportunities for ministry as the world hunkers down and waits with bated breath to see what is going to happen next. This passage we've looked at this morning challenges us on so many levels to up our game as the church. God has, has called us. He has set us apart for His purposes. He has empowered us and He has commissioned us. And He has high expectations of us. And it is our privilege to serve Him. As we boldly step out and do that, the hardship and the suffering that may come our way as a result is to be embraced with joy because through that we identify with the cross of Christ. We are called to risk life in the depth of grace. Let's go for it. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this incredible mystery that you revealed to Paul. Lord, thank you that Jew and Gentile are one and that you have called us to be your body, to be the church. And Lord, that the church is your chosen vehicle to bring about your purposes on earth, to bring about the establishment of your kingdom. Lord, thank you for your grace, which not only saves us, but which empowers us and gives us the ability that we need to serve you, to be ministers of your grace. Father, we thank you that as your church, we are called to this lofty ideal, Lord, of, of really being your vehicle. And Lord, once again, help us as the church right now, Lord, we may seem 
crippled. But Father, help us just through this time to really be powerful, to be strong, to be your ministers, to, to let your grace flow through us to a world which is confused and hurting and scared right now. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being your church. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, thank you uh, for joining me this morning. Um, please do keep an eye on the church's Facebook page. Uh, it will be one of our primary vehicles of communicating with you. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, please go uh, to our, if, uh, our Facebook page. Just go onto Facebook, search uh, Heronbridge Community Church, click on our page, and then click on the like icon because uh, that will then make sure that whenever we post something on Facebook, it will automatically pop up in your Facebook feed. But uh, if you haven't got Facebook, don't worry. We're still going to communicate via all the other means that we possibly can. That's it for today. Please be careful this week. Stay healthy. Let us know if you get sick or if you need anything. And uh, we'll see you all online at 9 o'clock next Sunday. God bless.